Welcome to Standing on the Word, a ministry of the South Seminole Baptist Church located at 1201 South Seminole Drive in Eastridge, Tennessee. We are a fellowship of believers dedicated to ministering to the Eastridge, North Georgia area. Here you will find an exciting children's worship and an active Awana program. Students will be challenged in Christian growth and provided times of wholesome fellowship. God's Word is taught to those of all ages. Worship services are times of praise and celebration. We invite you to join us each Sunday morning at 1045 and every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Now we ask you to stay with us as our pastor shares from God's Word. Allow the Lord to speak to your heart as the choir and congregation lead us in singing praises to our God.
like we've got a few coming from every direction, so that's good. I see a big man coming with a box. Kind of scares me. He's got one of them looks on his face. Let's see what we got here. All right, good job. Thank you, sir. All right. Come on down. Come on down, guys. All right. Well, listen, as you know, I can't know what's in the box right here. But it's okay. We're going to find, uh, look in it and see what it is and see if it can give us something to talk about today. Are you guys having a good day? Are you excited to be out of school? Wouldn't it be great if we could work something out to where y'all could just go back to school and y'all get to go every day anyway? That wouldn't be good? Okay. That's what I thought you would say. So, all right. Hey, let me ask you a question. Huh? Yeah, is this going to bite me? Who brought this? You bring this? Is it going to bite me really hard? Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, man, it is a baseball. Now, a baseball is an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. This is something, man, these, they are so fun. They get to do, you get to do so much with baseballs, okay? And, you know, a lot of people play on teams. A lot of people will play maybe in their yard. A lot of people will play just for the fun of it, maybe wherever you happen to play. But it's one of them games you can play it. As long as you've got a field or something, you can pretty much play it wherever you want, you know? You can go around and you can do it with a team of people. Or you can do it with you and just maybe one friend. It's, it kind of helps if you have somebody on the other team, you know. And uh, you, can, you can play this in a lot of different ways, and it's really exciting. You know, and you keep practicing, and you keep practicing, and you get better and better. Have you ever had enough practice when it comes to baseball? You think so? Do the, do the pros, do they still continue to practice? Absolutely, they still continue to practice because they realize that they've got to keep working at it and keep getting better at it. But you know what? You know what baseball reminds me of? Baseball reminds me of our walk with God. You see, you, don't, you, can, you can play around and you can pass and you can throw the ball up in the air. You can do it all by yourself just like you can have your own prayer life and just like you can sing songs all by yourself and things like that. But you know, when you are gathered around other people, other people can make things better. Because it seems like the more people we have together to praise Jesus, the more exciting it can be. And just like in a ball game, the more exciting it can be. When you get your full teams and maybe a big crowd or something like that, and people are able to cheer. And you know, you never get done practicing in baseball, and we never get done practicing being a Christian. Because every day we could grow a little bit closer to Jesus. So no matter what you do, no matter how old you get, moms and dads and grandparents, no matter how old you get, you can never practice enough in your relationship with God. The same as if you can never practice enough to be a good ball player. So make sure you keep that in mind. This was an awesome thing. First time anybody ever, anybody's ever brought something like that. So that is great. Listen. He alone is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. When the way is rough, the burden so heavy, the night so dark and so long, I will wait for Him till my soul in its silence finds hope in the One who is strong. He alone is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress, I will never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. His word is established in earth and is heaven, and only His truth will stand. I will seek His wisdom, Trust in His power, I know I'm secure in His hand, in His hand. He alone is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress, I will never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and salvation. 
He is my fortress, I will never be shaken, find rest, O oh, my soul, in God alone, my hope comes from Him, my hope comes from Him, my hope comes from Him. Thank you, Tony. Last Sunday, I started a new message series called The Essentials. Thank you. Everybody seems to be excited, in, including the piano, the keyboard. And of course, what we're talking about are the essentials when it comes to good church health. Now, if you want to be in good health, then all of your systems need to be working equally as well. If your respiratory system is working great, but the pulmonary system is not functioning well, then you are sick. And then you can get the pulmonary system working good again, but if your respiratory system goes south, you're still sick. And so every one of our systems need to work together and with full vitality. Well, that's true with the church as well. Uh, there are some essentials that we must have, not only working, but working together and working with full vitality in order for our church to be a healthy church. And, you know, we talk about wanting our church to grow, grow in spirit and grow in number. Well, healthy things naturally grow. So what are these essentials? Well, we learned last week uh, that one essential is evangelism. Uh, we are commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ to go and make disciples. Well, the first step in becoming a disciple is to trust Christ to be the forgiver of our sin and the leader of our lives. Well, evangelism is all about telling that story of how God loves us so much that Jesus died on the cross for us that we can have forgiveness and that we can be in right relationship with him. And so you can well imagine that, that evangelism is an essential vital part of good church health. Uh, another essential is fellowship. And true, genuine church body fellowship is doing life together. It's all about relationships. And so it's all about having the kind of relationship that uh, when things are great, you can celebrate with each other. When, when things are hard, uh, you can help each other and pray for each other. And it's not just about relationships uh, within the church, but it's about building relationships with those who are outside the church in hopes that one day we'll, we'll win the right to share the gospel with them and uh, tell them about Jesus. And then another essential is ministry, and that's meeting people at their point of need. Th that is another way uh, to win the right to share the gospel because when you meet people at their point of need, you get their attention, and you show in a tangible way that you care about them, that you love them, and that you're interested in their well-being, and then their mind and their heart uh, will we'll certainly be much more open to God's truth and the gospel story. And certainly we minister to each other with, within the body of Christ. And then another essential is discipleship. Discipleship is, is simply helping a new believer or a believer that's just returned to the Lord, helping them become a full-blown, committed follower of Jesus Christ. And so we teach people the 
Christian disciplines like prayer and Bible study and witnessing. And we also help people understand the, the truth and the doctrine of God's Word so that they know more about God and how He works in the lives of people. And then, of course, we teach them to follow Christ because the disciple really is a follower, a learner. And then the fifth essential is worship. And we're actually going to begin with worship as we talk week by week, one at a time, about these five essentials. One reason we're starting with worship is because Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, body, with just all that you are. That's the first commandment. Besides that, worship is something that is more eternal than even some of the other essentials because when we get to heaven, uh, there'll be no need to evangelize. Uh, there'll be no need to disciple. But we will be worshiping our Lord for all eternity. And so worship, understanding what it is and how to do it, is essential. It's vitally important for the church to be a church that has reached its full potential, a church that is really healthy. I heard about two boys up in New York City who were walking down the sidewalk and suddenly out of one of those alleyways between two buildings, an angry what Rottweiler came rushing towards them. And, uh, you know, teeth fully exposed. And attacked one of the boys. Well, well, the second boy happened to see a short two-by-four close by, and he picked that two-by-four up and aimed just right and hit the dog, and the dog released and, uh, and ran away. Well, a reporter from the New York Times heard about the incident and wanted to interview the second boy and hear the story of what happened. And so after the interview, the next day, headline in the newspaper, Yankee fan saves boy from rabid Rottweiler. Well, uh, the boy called the reporter and said, appreciate the story, but actually I'm not a Yankee fan. You're not? Well, okay, okay, I'll correct that. And so the next day, headline in the paper, Mets fan saves boy from rabid Rottweiler. The boy called the reporter again, said, thanks for trying to correct things, but actually I am not a Mets fan. He said, you're not? No. Well, Who's your team then? What team are you a fan of? Well, actually, I am a fan of the Tennessee Titans. Always have been, always will be. The reporter said, okay, I'll correct that. Next day, in the paper, redneck idiot <laughs> beats family-friendly pet. Now, you see, it's all your perspective. And when it comes to worship, we come with different understandings, definitions, perspectives on what true worship is. I mean, a Baptist and a Catholic and a Church of God believer, all three of those are going to have totally different understandings and experiences when it comes to worship. Uh, there can be uh, generational differences. Somebody who's young might have a different idea of what true worship is from a senior saint. Uh, there certainly can be cultural differences. But I think there is one thing that we could all agree on. And that is that as God's people, 
we need to rediscover the dynamics of true worship. No place in Scripture do you read anything about dead worship. No place in Scripture do you get the idea that worship is, you know, with a long mule face, with, with no joy, and, and really bar barely paying attention, just kind of mouthing from rote memory the songs that we sing. So I think that we can all agree that no matter the church, we could all learn a little bit more about the value and the dynamics and the how-to of worship. I think what has happened is that as God's people, we have gotten to the place that we worship our work and we work at our play and we play at our worship. And so, if worship is indeed an essential when it comes to good church health, then we need to understand what it is. And so let's begin with the what of worship. And before I tell you what worship is, let's talk about what worship is not. True worship is not an event. It is not the Sunday morning service. You know, we talk about, well, we went to Sunday school and then we went to worship. Well, that's not how worship works. Because you see, you can come to 52 Sunday morning services in a row and never have worshiped. And so it's not an event. It's not the name of something that's going to happen in the bulletin. It's much more than that. It, it also is, is not just the music. Um, some folks have the idea that uh, uh, the music in the worship service is, is there to separate the announcement. I mean, that's about how much they value the music. Or, or perhaps it, it's what, you know, kind of warms you up so that you're ready for the main event, the sermon. Worship certainly can include music, but worship is the giving, it's the teaching, it's the singing, it's the praying. It's all about focusing on Him. In fact, uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, uh, let's look at Matthew uh, chapter 15 and verse 8. I want you to see this. Matthew 15, 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So you can actually sing all the songs and mouth all the words and not worship. Worship also is not a performance. You know, we live in a performance-driven society. And, and sometimes we look at worship as performance that is to be graded. Well, boy, that was A-plus grade worship today. I really enjoyed that. Or, I don't know, I didn't really get anything out of much of that. I didn't really like that. And so that gets a failing grade from me. Keep in mind, you're not the audience. I'm not the audience. God is the audience. He's the one that is watching and waiting and enjoying our praise and worship. Now, I might be one to sort of prompt you. Tony might be someone who 
prompts you to sing. The choir, that's a group that prompts you to sing. But you are the ones who are before the Lord, and He is an audience of one. Worship is not a feeling. Sometimes people get the idea, if, if I really have an emotional experience, I mean, if it, if it really tugs at my heart, if it makes me cry, or if it makes me, you know, uh, uh, you know have goosebumps all over, well, boy, that, that was really worship. And if it doesn't quiver my liver, then, then somehow it wasn't worship. It's not a feeling. And it certainly is not something that can be confined to an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning because we are to worship throughout the day, throughout the week, when we're alone with God in His Word, in prayer, as we're driving down the road and uh, a thought of Him comes to us and we just out of gratitude say, thank you, Lord. We... Uh, can certainly worship God in a Bible study group or as we are ministering in some way or as we're doing the dishes or at least putting them in the dishwasher. So worship is not something that's confined just to this hour and 15-minute event every Sunday morning. So what is worship? Well, first of all, it is a response to God. Uh, turn over, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Chapter 4, verse 19. I want you to see this. It's a short verse, but an important one. We love him because he first loved us. And so because of his expression to love towards us, we can't help but respond. I mean, if we fully grasp it and understand how black and ugly and dirty our sin is and how great God's love is and how that he proved his love by putting all of that sin on his son to bear the burden and pay the penalty, pay the price of our willful disobedience. I mean, that's just one pretty good reason for us to respond with an attitude of gratitude and a spirit of worship towards the Lord. Well, worship is also to be from the heart. Turn to uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now notice it mentions psalms. That's, that's one kind of expression. One kind of music, one kind of style of worship, and then there's hymns, and then there's spiritual songs. So my point is, worship is not about style. It's, it's not about singing 15th century dirges. It's not about singing southern gospel songs. It's not about singing contemporary songs. It's not about singing the hymns because all of those can be used as an avenue by which we focus on him and who he is and what he's done for us. And so since worship is a matter of the heart, it's an attitude of what's on the inside, then all of us can worship, can think of Him, can appreciate Him, can have an attitude of gratitude no matter 
the style of music that's being used. So true worship is from the heart. It is also declaring worth. You see, he is worthy of our praise. He is worth. He's valuable. He's worth something to us. In fact, the word worship started out worth-ship. Look, if you would, in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Now, this is in God's throne room. And all the Old Testament saints, all the New Testament saints, all of creation, angels, they're all there, and this is what they're saying. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And so when we sing the songs of thanksgiving or the songs uh, announcing who God is, then we are declaring his worth his value, his awesomeness, his strength, his might, his love, we're declaring to him how much we love him. And worship is a choice. Look quickly at Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 6. Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Do you realize that, 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 that God is here? I mean, yes, He is the audience of one, but Jesus promised where two or more are gathered together, I will be right in the middle of you. And so, since God is here, we have a choice. We can acknowledge his presence. We can be strengthened by his power. We can express our worship and praise to him because he is worthy. Or we cannot. It is a choice. And then finally, worship is about giving and not getting. Have you ever heard anyone say, well, Boy, I got a lot out of that sermon, or I got a lot out of that special, that, that song. It just really spoke to me. Well, great. That's wonderful. I've also heard people walk out and say, well, I just didn't get anything out of that. I don't know what he was thinking. I, he, must have, he must have been playing video games while he should have been preparing for his sermon because I didn't get anything out of that. Or I didn't, I didn't like that music today, so I... I, I that's not my cup of tea, so I, I can't get anything out of that. Since when did worship become about getting? Worship is not about getting anything. Worship is about giving honor and praise to Him. That's what worship is. So, if that's what worship is, then why should we worship? What is the why of worship? Well, first of all, we worship because of who God is. Now, we praise Him for what He does, but we worship Him and express His value and worth to us because of who He is. And that puts our focus on Him. If we're not careful... Even when we're praising him for what he does for me, I can have my focus on me. In fact, I can get a little perturbed at God because he hasn't blessed me like I think he should. And so, whereas expressing praise and thanksgiving to him for what he does is a great thing, worship is focused on him and Praising him for who he is. We finally got to the main text, although we're way 
past halfway in the message, but we finally got uh, uh, to the main text, and that is Psalm 95. So if you would, turn and camp out for the rest of the time in Psalm 95. Look at what it says in verse 1. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. That's who he is. Uh, let us shout joyfully to the rock. That's who he is of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is our great God. And he is the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. And the sea is his, for he made it. He is creator God. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. He is our maker, for he is our God. That's why we worship him, because of who he is. He is our rock. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the balm of Gilead. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one. He is Emmanuel. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. That's why we worship him. And that's why it's not about us. It's all about him. And so true worship can happen when God's people are together. No matter what the sermon is, no matter how the prayer is prayed, no matter how the song is sung, it's about him. But we also worship him because of who we are. Look at what it says at the end of verse 7, Psalm 95. And we are the people of his pasture the sheep of his hand. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. He is the creator. We are his creations. He is the king. We are his subjects. He is the maker. We are his servants. He is the vine. We are the branches. And so because of the place we have in the order of things, we have every good reason to worship him. So if, if this is what worship really is, and, and, and if because of who he is is the reason that we worship, then let's get down to brass tacks. How do we worship? Well, of course, we worship corporately. We worship together. Work two or more are gathered together. In fact, look back at Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing. Let us shout joyfully. Verse 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully. Uh, down in verse 6, let us kneel before the Lord. Uh, that is exactly why in Hebrews uh, chapter 10 and uh, uh, verse 25, uh, we are in essence challenged. We are asked to be committed to not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the closer it gets to Jesus' is coming it is, is all the more motivation that we should be getting together <laughs> and praising him and honoring him for who he is. So when somebody says, well, I'm not going to worship because I just don't like what they do. What? I used to tell my people when I pastored for 30 years, look, if what we just did wasn't your cup of tea, and I understand that, you know, everybody has 
different preferences. You know, we're wired differently. We have different backgrounds. You know, we have uh, uh, different expectations. None of that is bad. God wired us different. But if, if what we just did wasn't your cup of tea, then, then hold on to the back of your pew because in just a minute we're going to do something that you probably will like. And if there's nothing in the service that you liked, then come back next week because percentage chances say we're bound to hit on something that you like next week. But to say, I'm not coming because they don't do what I like. We're told to not forsake the assembly together of ourselves. We also worship verbally. Look back at Psalm 95. It says, come let us sing to the Lord, verse 1. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Now, let me ask you this question. How are you going to sing and shout without opening up your mouth? Now, unless you are an excellent ventriloquist, not happening. So worship is not about folding your hands and standing there and counting the ceiling tiles if we had them or thinking about lunch or wishing this part of the service would be over. That's not worship. It's about participation. Look, worship is not a spectator sport. It's about getting in the game. And uh, I'm confident that people with an attitude of gratitude may not have a good voice, might be burdened and sorrowful today, so might not have a big, happy smile on their face, but they're expressing to him in word how much they are grateful for who he is and what he's doing, even though times may be hard. Worship is also to be done physically. Look at verse 6 of Psalm 95. Come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. Elsewhere in Scripture, it calls for us to clap our hands, to, to raise our hands. Look, certainly we need to have an attitude of worship, an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of reverence, an attitude of a sense of awe, an attitude of praise, an attitude of love. Yes, worship is about the attitude of the heart, but what should happen is the attitude should ooze out, and it, it, it should come out in, in our clapping or in our praising uh, him with lifted hands or, you know, tap the foot or... or uh, bow your head before him. However it is that you respond physically to worshiping him, uh, j just, just keep in mind that all of this is just an avenue for you in every way, spirit, soul, and body, to praise him. And finally, we are to worship him obediently. Look at what it says at the end of verse 7, Psalm 95. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Now, the way that sheep follow the shepherd is by listening for his voice and then doing what he says. So you see, worship is more than just a few songs. Worship is a lifestyle of putting God first and obeying him and following him and, and doing what his word says. What we do here on Sunday morning is merely putting to music or putting 
into prayer or putting into teaching what is already in our hearts because we have an attitude of fellowship and obedience and thanksgiving and praise to him. Let me read something to you. What I'm about to read was actually written by a high school girl. And she wrote this letter to her friend. She says, I attended your church today. Although you had invited me, you weren't there. I looked for you, hoping to sit with you. I sat alone. As a stranger, I wanted to sit near the back of the church, but those rows were all packed with regular attenders. So ushers took me to the front. I felt like I was on parade. During the singing of the hymns, I was surprised to note that some of the church people weren't singing. Between their sighs and yawns, they just stared into space. Three of the kids that I had respected on campus were whispering to one another throughout the whole service. Another girl was giggling. I really didn't expect that in your church. The pastor's sermon was interesting, although some members of the choir didn't seem to think so, that they looked bored and restless, and, and one kept smiling at someone in the congregation. Uh, there were several people who left and then came back during the sermon. I thought, how rude. I could hear the constant shuffling of feet and doors opening and closing. Uh, the pastor spoke about the reality of faith. The message got to me. And I made my mind up to speak to someone about it after the service. But utter chaos reigned after the benediction. I said good morning to one couple, but their response was less than cordial. I looked for some teens with whom I could discuss the sermon, but they were all huddled in a corner talking about the newest music group. My parents, they don't go to church. I came alone yesterday hoping to find a place to truly worship and feel some love. I'm sorry, but I didn't find that at your church. And I won't be back. Yes, true worship is about an audience of one, and he is watching us, and he is enjoying the attention and the praise and the honor. But he's not the only one watching. And if we want to win the future generations to come, then we need to express genuine worship. Genuine, from the heart, to God kind of worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would take your word and speak to our minds and to our hearts and to our very souls. And I pray that you would help us to see not only your worth, but the value of authentic, true worship. And I pray that we would somehow be able to put away ourselves and what, what we enjoy, what we want, what we think is good worship. Thank you for watching Standing on the Word. We invite you to be with us each Sunday morning at 1045 and every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. The South Seminole Baptist Church is located at 1201 South Seminole Drive in East Ridge, Tennessee. We invite you to join us, and together we will share in Standing on the Word.